it's clear that there's another part to this whole matter. And that is living in an unsafe world. And it is an unsafe world. And many have reactions that are sometimes not very realistic and very not healthy. Dr. Pelkowitz is the Strauss Professor of Psychology and Education at Yeshiva University. He's a world-renowned expert in trauma. He's well known to our community. He's a good friend of High Lifeline. And it's a privilege and an honor to introduce Dr. David Pelkowitz. Thank you. L let me start by um, thanking Chai Lifeline, um, Rabbi Scholar, Norman, the whole team, uh, for the incredible work that they've done in the past uh, week, but also in general, to know that there's this incredibly dedicated, compassionate team that's always there any hour of the day or the night to guide people when they most need guidance and to stand by our sides is, is an incredible source of nechama and something that I'm personally proud of. I don't know of a parallel program as creative and as um, dedicated to that kind of services. And that's, there are many wonderful programs in our community. And as I look on this audience, and I see the amazing achdus, the amazing kind of shared pain. I think that's the beginning of nechama. Rabbi Schwab would say that the Hebrew word nechama, which we usually understand as meaning comfort, doesn't really mean comfort in the traditional sense. He starts with the first time in the Torah it says, nechama ki nichamti ki hasisim, a reconsideration on whether the world should have been created. Again, maybe there'll be a reconsideration. And he explains, Nechama means a shift in perspective. It's a different way of looking at things over time. And perhaps the beginning of Nechama is in this room. The beginning of Nechama is personally figuring out how to find meaning and how to go from passive to active in trying to find our own personal kind of of self-examination and insight into how to somehow reconsider what we can learn from this. There are three opening points I want to make. Number one, which was alluded to by Dr. Blumenthal so beautifully, is, is a very basic point, and it comes to something that I've shared at a number of High Lifeline retreats. It was um, a colleague of mine He's one of the leading researchers in post-traumatic stress disorder in the world. And he once showed me an fMRI, a picture of a brain of a man who was caught in the stairwell of the World Trade Center on 9-11. And he was able to take a picture of this man's brain as he was having a flashback to that horrible moment a decade ago. When I looked at it, what hit me immediately was Vaido Maron. This is Demimus, because what you see when faced with overwhelming sadness and overwhelming trauma, you know what your brain looks like? The language center shut down. We're beyond words, so we're just hearing. You can't, practically can't even think about davening. You can't think about where to go. It's, it's frozen. And then, what Dr. Van der Kolk shows and showed me over time was that as he gave his patient words, as he lit up Broca's areas, he changed the demimus, the utter silence, to words that brought Nacham and brought a shift in perspective, that's where the refuah came from. The refuah comes from naming the monster. It comes from giving words to our pain. And it comes from energizing ourselves. And again, that's what we do as a community. There's been a body of research that's come out in neurobiology just in the past few years. And, and I was thinking about that as I look at this um, turnout. It's about something called mirror neurons. 
mirror neurons are, go like this. As I'm speaking to you all and I move my hands like this, if you had a picture of my brain, you'd see in the motor cortex of my brain a specific neuron assigned to going like this. What's been discovered in the last five years is that each of you, as you look at me go like this, you have a corresponding motor neuron in your brain, and guess what it's doing? It's going like this. Because we're hardwired to be no se ba'olam chavera. We're hardwired for empathy. But we have to mine it. It's not enough that we're hardwired to respond to suffering and loss by literally sharing in the pain. What I was asked to talk about in this section is how do we go from that basic, basic sharing and the suffering of others, how do we go to that next step? And that leads me to the final opening point, which has to do with the basic, basic point. And that's all the research on keeping our children safe shows the following basic truth. And it goes like this. If our anxiety levels go way up, through the roof, it's not good. It's not good for protection. We actually don't protect as well. If it stays too down, if we go back to a new normal that includes not learning the lessons of this tragedy, it's not good either. What we need to do is, is we need to hold on to the lessons of this week. And we need to not forget them, but we need to do it in a way that's constructive. You know. In 1991, there was a school shooting on a playground in Los Angeles. And a colleague of mine was doing some research to try to understand why there was a different response in different children, what predicted resilience, what didn't. There were two kids, two nine-year-olds, pinned down by the gunfire. And one had a horrible post-traumatic reaction. One was completely fine. So, my colleague was interviewing the boy who was fine. He was asking, what's your secret? You were exactly next to other people who were falling apart. You were in just as much danger as anybody else. Why, why are you doing so well? And the boy said the following, and with this I'll go into the specifics. He said, you know something? He said, just a week ago, my community had a get together and they taught us earthquake preparation. This is in Los Angeles. They taught us what to do in case of an earthquake. The shooting started, and I think to myself, well, this is a little bit like an earthquake. So I go, and I go for cover, just like they taught me, and I knew I'd be okay. Now, in fact, he was no safer than the kids next to him, but he believed he was safer. And that's what research on child safety shows. What research shows is, if all we do is talk to our children about what to do, if a stranger approaches them, even if it's a friendly stranger, okay? And even if all we do is talk to our children about what to do if there's the beginnings of inappropriate touch in a relationship with somebody they know, then even if, God forbid, that happens, not only are they armed with a set of tools on how to handle it, but they also deal with it much better. It keeps them at just the right level of being energized. And for me, that's my nechama. My nechama is to be able to share with you a few basic points, a few basic kinds of strategies, because in a way, that is something we could do. I remember that the day after 9-11, I heard Rav Matzio Solomon speak here in Brooklyn. And he said something that I think is equally true for the points I'm about to get you. And it's exactly the point of all this research. He says, why is it that we're compared to an eagle in times of danger, right? Kinesher, Yair, Kino, Al Gozal, of Yerachev. Why of all living things is it an eagle that we're compared to? And he answers, because unlike any other living thing, any other living thing, when it's in danger, its mother swoops down and will fly, let's say, a baby bird to safety. The baby bird is in a passive position. But an eagle, because she flies higher than any other living thing, you know what she does? She swoops down on the nest, 
The baby has to hop on her back, and as she flies the baby to safety, that baby had to take an active step in its own deliverance. He says, that's our answer. That's our answer to suffering. It's our answer to anything that goes like this. The equivalent to bouncing and to jumping onto the back of the mother is now what I'm going to share with you. Number one, in terms of prevention and child safety, the most important opening point is you have to put it in the context of general safety. When you teach your kids how to cross the street safely, when you teach your kids water safety in the summer or fire safety come Hanukkah time, it's not particularly anxiety provoking. You know, maybe there's a little bit of anxiety, but it's at just the right level, okay? Same thing here. When we teach our children safety in terms of boundaries, in terms of any kind of abusive situation, we should think of it as no different than any other kind of general safety rules. And the basic rules are really very simple. They're not that, they're not that complicated. The basic rules are rules like basically letting children know that no matter what happens, they could always come to you. That there is nothing that happens out there. Kids tend to blame themselves that would lead to the loss of your love. So no matter what happens, even if they're walking in a neighborhood that you told them not to walk in, and let's say a stranger approaches them, or they talk to somebody who maybe you warned them against talking to that person, you don't want that going underground. They need to know that no matter what, you're going to be incredibly proud of them for coming to you. That's point number one. Point number two is just some basics about touching. I think it's extremely important for us to talk about. I'll talk about stranger safety in a minute. But unfortunately, the majority of the need is with children needing to know that sometimes the danger comes from people we actually know. And that's just what we have to understand. So in terms of, at the most basic level, for a preschooler to tell them something as basic as there are three kinds of touches, this is from Dr. Shulman's approach here in Borough Park. The yet, there's three kinds of touches. The yes touch, like when mommy hugs you. The no touch, like when your friend hits you. And the I don't know touch. This is when someone touches you and it doesn't hurt, but it makes you feel funny. If anybody touches you that way, scream no and go away. And I'll be proud of you for coming to tell me. The next important point is almost always when children get into a dangerous kind of relationship with either somebody they know or somebody they don't know, there's secrecy involved. The only way it could continue is the abusive individual says, whatever you do, don't tell. Don't light up the language centers of the brain by telling. The abusive person says, if you keep it secret, you'll be fine. And the secret becomes both the source of protection for the child, because they believe they'll be OK, nobody will know, and it becomes the source of shame. And as a result, the child will often just live with it, because it's more common that what happens in unsafe situations is that it's not as dramatic an incident as happened last week. What's more common is that there's a grooming process and a gradual process over time. And we need to protect our children by talking to them again without terrifying them, playing what-if games, and talking about areas that clearly aren't abusive but that make them feel uncomfortable. I don't know how many of you had an uncle who would tickle you past the point of comfort. That wasn't class for Shulman. That wasn't abusive. It was just what uncles do sometimes for a living, OK? But to tell a child, if somebody is touching you in that way, tickling you, OK, in a way that you feel uncomfortable, it's OK to say no. And if your uncle doesn't stop, come and tell me. Not, God forbid, because we're saying that there's something horrible going on. That's normal stuff. That's totally normal. But in order to teach them in these kinds of situations that they could talk to you about it and you could do a number of what-if scenarios so that it's not an event, it's a process. It's not one talk you have with your kid about safety. And this leads me 
to a couple of recommendations about stranger safety, because that's obviously the most immediate issue here. So the recommendations about stranger safety, and I'm coming to an end because we do want to have time for the other talks and for questions, is that first of all, children have many misconceptions about who a stranger is. We have to tell them and redefine it for the firm community now, unfortunately. It's very sad. But we have to tell them that a stranger is anybody we don't know. No matter how nice they look, no matter how much like us they look, we can't tell what they're like on the inside. Most strangers are good, kind, and friendly, but there are four rules to fo follow if you're alone and a stranger approaches you. One is stay at arm's length. Don't talk to them for any length of time if you possibly can. Don't take anything from them, even if it's something of your own. Don't go anywhere with them. Don't get in a car with them. The recommendations, which are very wise, that have been shared this week, Norman shared with me, and I think they're all excellent recommendations. One is, if a child is alone and they get lost, is tell them to, if they don't see anybody they know, go to a mother who's walking with her children. I think it's excellent advice. Excellent, excellent advice. Go to a mother who's walking with her children. I've never heard of a situation where that's been a dangerous situation, at least in our community. Number two, it's whatever you do, tell them not to go into a car. You may have somebody saying, oh, your dad or your mom told me to pick you up. You don't know me. I'm Mr. So-and-so. I'm going to, supposed to give you a lift home. Tell them no matter what, don't get in a car with somebody you don't know and you don't know well. And then, if somebody has a cell phone, obviously, to go to a policeman if you can, or a policewoman if you can, but also to go to somebody with a cell phone in order to um, see if they could call, if need be, 911 or call home. These are all common sense recommendations. It's sad to have to say it. We pride ourselves in being a large family, and we are. But unfortunately, this is the new normal. Let me end with a story that I've shared with some of you, but it's a story that I think bounced off my head most when I saw and experienced the events of the last week. It's a story about also World War II. My wife's uncle was a GI. He was an American soldier who was part of a group of soldiers who were being asked to liberate a concentration camp. And their commanding officer gets up and he tells all the soldiers, listen, we just got word from intelligence that there are a number of children who survived this camp. You've been giving candy bars to children all over Europe. And what we want you to know is that even though these children are going to look very malnourished to you, whatever you do, don't feed them because their digestive systems are so undeveloped that even a single Hershey bar could prove fatal. So my uncle goes into the camps. He goes straight, makes a beeline right for the children's barracks. I think that's what any of us would do. And he sees this horrendous scene that we've all seen pictures of, of the walking skeletons. And he's frozen. He doesn't know what to do. He knows he can't at least feed them. So spontaneously, he goes over to one of the children and gives him a hug. And from one end of the children's barracks to the other, a line formed of the children waiting for that hug. And that's the image that I want to end with, because it's the image of the collective hug, the image of us all standing together, giving our children a hug of protection. You know those children? We know, many of us know survivors who were those children. And what the research shows is even though psychologists told us they should not have done so well psychologically, we know that in spite of whatever scars, as long as that hug continued metaphorically for the remainder of their life, resilience was the norm. And I think that's the image that we have to have. We have to continue to stand by each other's side. We have to continue having our mirror neurons bouncing off each other and continue to light up the language centers of our brain and of our children's brain by going from passive to active. Thank you.